Welcome to the Retzel Health Law Hotspot. Health Law Hotspot is a podcast for physicians and health professionals that covers the legal issues and trends that affect the healthcare industry. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Health Law Hotspot. I'm Erica Adler, shareholder and leader of the healthcare practice at Retzel and Andrews. Today, I am joined by Christina Kuda, who's part of our healthcare practice and an expert on all things healthcare. And we're going to be talking about some of the limitations on non-physician practitioners in terms of the services that they provide and the role of physicians in supervising those practitioners. As you may be aware, there's a lot of mid-levels and other non-doctor practitioners who work in doctor's offices, they might work in med spas, they may work in hospitals, and depending on their licensure, they require a different amount of supervision, and in some places, they may be independent. And so what Christina and I really want to talk about today are some of the times when those non-licensed practitioners might go beyond the bounds of what they're allowed to do and what the repercussions might be for the practices and the physicians that they work for. So Christina, why don't you get us started? Thanks, Erica. So as Erica indicated, a lot of our talk today is gonna be regarding scope of practice issues and sort of what happens when services are provided by a licensed provider, but perhaps that licensed provider is not allowed without certain uh, provisions being taken in advance to provide a particular service. And how this came up recently with us is in Illinois, some of you may be familiar with, I think it did make some national news. There was what I call a, a bad Botox incident a few weeks ago where uh, two individuals received Botox that was injected by a registered nurse. And that Botox turned out to be um, tainted. And both uh, individuals, I believe, got botulism and became pretty sick from those injections. And as a result, here in Illinois, the Illinois Department of Public Health actually put out guidance, which is kind of rare. They don't put out a lot of formal guidance on these issues, but they put out specific guidance on scope of practices related to medical spas and related to these types of services, Botox and other types of injectables. And many states have similar scopes of practice uh, related to who can provide certain services, the level of supervision, and how the services can be provided. Again, what was unusual is that IDPH, Illinois Department of Public Health, actually put out specific guidance to address this. Um, and one of the things they talked about in the guidance is that registered nurses, while their general scope of practice is to be able to give injections, very common to get an antibiotic shot or a vaccine shot, from a registered nurse for Botox and similar injectable medications, fillers, Restylane, et cetera, those are not within an RN's actual scope of practice. They must be supervised by a physician, meaning that the physician is the one that ordered the Botox or injectable. This is a patient of the physicians. A proper assessment was conducted prior to the injection of this medication. And this nurse is doing the injections under the supervision of this physician and not simply opening their own spa or going into someone's homes. Uh, many of you are probably aware of what is commonly referred to as Botox parties, where someone will come into a home and people will be there to, to receive Botox. None of that is lawful or allowed in Illinois and in many other states under a nurse's particular license. Now, there are some also some other professions that have some limitations on these types of injectables. Um, Illinois Department of Public Health made it very clear that estheticians and cosmetologists cannot perform injections at any time under their licenses. Um, they did say, though, that mid-level providers, uh, for example, advanced practice registered nurses and physician assistants can perform and prescribe these injectables as long as it is appropriate and allowed under the collaborative agreement with, they have with physicians, excluding those nurse practitioners that have full scope of practice. Again, while this is Illinois specific, many states have similar laws with respect to mid-level providers. Right. And this is a pretty common arrangement. And one thing I'll just mention that a lot of people misunderstand, the supervision 
of a physician over a mid-level or non-mid-level, a different kind of provider is not the same as supervision for billing purposes. So people really need to understand what supervision is required. Also, the physician needs to be aware that failure to provide required supervision can put the physician's license at risk, allowing people to do things that they're not allowed to do, like in this case, an RN doing Botox, can put the practice and the physician's license at risk. And so there's, you know, it's not just the the mid-level practitioner's issue or the non-doctor's issue, the doctors in the practice can be held responsible under their license for failure to provide that type of supervision that they're required. Um, and also, if they do things that are really outside their own scope of practice, and I know we've talked about this before, but if you're a cardiologist and you set up a med spa or you work somewhere as a med spa on the side, supervising people doing services that you yourself aren't experienced doing, that can also be a problem. So I think people need to kind of be really cautious because there's this new frontier of exciting med spa type services and a lot of people are not taking the time to make sure that they know what they're doing. And I think that's really important about the RN type services. Absolutely. And, you know, even to, to take that a little further, too, I know in Illinois and several other states, their medical practice acts or the acts and, and regulations they have that um, are related to physician's licensing will often have limitations on liability. So if a physician is a collaborative physician or a supervising physician for a mid-level provider, he or she generally is not liable for the acts of that mid-level provider as long as that physician is providing appropriate supervision and collaborative services. So your state laws will inform us to what those appropriate collaboration requirements are. And they may be different even between working as a collaborating physician for a nurse practitioner or working as a collaborative physician for a physician assistant. So any liability limitations set forth by statute um, you know, can uh, not stand if the physician did not properly um, supervise or collaborate with a mid-level. I, I think another issue that needs to be talked about that, that often is not discussed is obtaining these medications. So for example, we're talking about Botox and injectables. A lot of people think, well, if you can get it online, that's fine, you can get it online. Um, you know, not true. There are a lot of laws, state and federal laws that inform buying prescription medications online, and you need to be very mindful of where you're getting these medications from. Like in the recent Illinois example, the medication was tainted. We don't know where it was purchased from, but obviously it was either not prepared or not stored properly. Um, you know, additionally, we'll hear a lot about people who want to open med spas and a doctor will say, well, I'll just, you know, uh, loan them my license to to buy prescription medications. There is no such thing as loaning a license. If you're a provider and people are receiving prescription medication, you're responsible for those prescriptions. So you need to make sure that they're appropriate for the physician, there is a workup, there is a history, there is a review of this patient to make sure that uh, it's appropriate for that patient to receive the medication. You know, the, the argument that, well, I, I was hands off, I trusted the spa, and I just allowed them to use my license to order the medication is, is not going to fly if there's a liability action. And it's certainly not going to be a great defense to a license action if the state licensing board finds out what happened. So you need to be very, very mindful of, of how you're handling prescriptions. Yeah, I think great point. And, you know, we're also seeing a lot of infusion clinics. Um, a lot of med spas are offering, you know, Ozempic and other similar mm -hmm. drugs as well. So, you know, as they start to expand the type of services they're offering, um, we need to, and when I say we, I mean, you know, the healthcare industry needs to be on top of the supervision requirements for those type of products. And doctors need to make sure that they're overseeing uh, those products, you know, who qualifies for them, how often do they need to meet to talk about potential consequences of, you know, or bad reactions or who's a good candidate and who's not. So, um, you know, just because you're familiar with one of the services that a spa might offer, you may not be familiar with with all of them, and especially because we're seeing really a growth in the type of uh, products being offered. So um, really, Absolutely. you know, you got to stay on top of things. Absolutely. And there are even services that I think oftentimes 
um, people don't think of as the practice of medicine. And they think that a spa can provide those services and they don't need any physician supervision or any you know, mid-level provider involvement. But you know, just to give you kind of an example, this is coming from a list um, in Illinois, but I've seen these types of services on lists for many other states constituting the practice of medicine. Things like chemical peels, Botox or injectables, collagen injections, liposuction, uh, microdermabrasion, dermaplating, microneedling, radiofrequency, and even microblading and colonics if they're you know, representations of health benefits. All these things are considered by many states to be the actual practice of medicine. So a spa that opens up and says, hey, we're going to do microneedling or we're going to do dermaplaning because we have somebody who's trained on doing that fantastic, but that's the practice of medicine. So it has to be done pursuant to evaluation, assessment, and proper medical protocols. Great. Yeah. I think that's really important. I suspect there's a lot of those services being offered um, through location that are not owned or supervised uh, by any physician or other licensed individual who's allowed to do that. So hopefully this has been informative for everyone out there uh, on this topic, and we're happy to answer any questions. Christina, any final words you want to share? Yeah, particularly for uh, providers who are being asked to be involved in medical spas and to sort of, you know, be involved as a medical director role or maybe an ownership role. Um, a lot of people just assume it's really signing some paperwork and, you know, they'll get a small uh, stipend every month for providing that service. And the med spa owners know what they're doing because they're involved in the industry. And while they may know what they're doing, um, just always double check what you're being responsible for, what you're asked to do what's being done at the spa and to make sure that you're aware of anything that would constitute the practice of medicine or would really walk up to that line and that you're appropriately providing services related to those treatments and related to those patients. Because at the end of the day, the person who owns the Medi Spa, who's not a licensed provider, doesn't have a license to lose. But if you're the physician or a mid-level provider who's being asked to work with these spas, you have the license that's going to be subject to discipline if it turns out that the arrangement was not appropriate. Right, and I, I don't want anyone to think there aren't ways to set this up properly where all the parties are safe and can can you know yeah. function legally. You know, we work with a lot of doctors and non-doctors in setting up these arrangements. What we're really warning about is for those who aren't familiar with the requirements, don't do their homework, don't stay on top of the law in the state they're in, there may be some consequences. And so I think if you want to set it up right, you should be talking to legal counsel, um, not just, you know, med spa consultants who are often not familiar with the law at all or give bad advice. Um, you really need to talk to somebody who's familiar with the law. And if anybody has any questions, we certainly welcome you to reach out to us and we're happy to answer them. All right, any final words? Uh, but one last thing I just thought of, on multiple occasions, I've worked with medical spas who have listened to the advice of the person selling them the equipment to provide a service, and about eight out of 10 times, that advice was very wrong. So always trust and get your own, uh, trust to get your own information and your own legal advice. Okay, great. All right. Well, thanks to Christina, as always, for being my best guest. And thank you for joining us on the Health Law Hotspot. We'll be back soon with another episode. And you can catch all of our prior episodes at ralaw.com. We'll see you soon. The Retzel Health Law Hotspot is made available by the firm and its attorneys for educational purposes and to provide general information, not to provide specific legal advice. Use of the Wetzel Health Law Hotspot does not create an attorney-client relationship between you and the firm or any of its attorneys. The Wetzel Health Law Hotspot should not be used as a substitute for competent legal advice, and you should contact an attorney in your state about any legal needs or questions you may have.